hey, this is a very tiny mass spectrometer, and I'm going to take it apart. So, I got this almost by accident. I was buying some random vacuum parts with something that looked like a nice electrical feed-through, maybe a titanium sublimation pump. The images on eBay wasn't that good, but I assumed I couldn't see the small pins here. I could only see these three big pins, and I assumed those were like high current pins on a conflat flange, so I immediately assumed something like a sublimation device. But to my delight, it was actually a tiny mass spectrometer. This is a Balzer's QMA064. It says so right there, if you can see it. And this is what is known as a residual gas analyzer, also known as an RGA. It is a real mass spectrometer, albeit a tiny one, but it's usually used specifically for diagnosing vacuum systems. They do also have roles in research as like small, cheap mass spectrometers for atmospheric analysis, typically. But the main point is that they're usually pretty simple. They are almost always flange mounted like this, so you can basically plumb this into any high vacuum system you want. And they're usually something that is very similar to what you would find in a GCMS. So some kind of electron impact ion source a quadrupole and a detector. I'm going to attempt to actually build the electronics for this and get it working because I think it's a nice challenge and this is... I had to take this apart when I got it because it was kind of rattly. It's intact, nothing is broken, but it's by far the simplest mass spectrometer I've ever seen. There's only something like five connections to the outside world, so it should be pretty easy to interface. They serve the function as the leak detector. This is a really neat trick where you tune your mass spectrometer to only detect something like a live extracted ion chromatogram, where you only look at the mass of helium, and then you go around with a, a bottle of compressed helium, and then you squirt that around the exterior envelope of your vacuum system with a little hose. And if there is a leak, then the helium will enter, and then the mass spectrometer will be immediately will immediately give a reading, but only for helium. So it's pretty it's pretty stable, actually. When you say residual gas analysis in a vacuum system, you're basically talking about, you know, there's almost nothing left, but that nothing has to be something. And you then do mass spectrometry on whatever ions are left or gases are left, and you see what kind of things they are. If you see characteristic nitrogen and oxygen in the correct proportions, then it's probably a leak to open air somewhere. You may also, if you have a very, very wet vacuum system, you may also see a significant amount of water. You can also see this with this. And let's say you have a big process system with different gases you can let in and out. If you see the masses of these gases when they shouldn't be there, then maybe you have a leak in some kind of uh, mass flow controller or needle valve or something like that. So they are quite handy. They are usually characterized also by having quite a limited mass range. I think the biggest ones has a mass range of about 0 to 300 AMU. This one, this tiny baby one, and it really is smaller than a beer can, um, has a mass range of 0 to 60 AMU. Um, if you are an analytical chemist or a chemist in general, you will think, okay, that is extremely pointless. Um, but it is actually pretty smart, especially if you are uh, doing analysis on permanent gases, because most permanent gases will have a mass lower than that. The original reason why you would want a higher mass range for uh, residual gas analysis is to be able to also detect uh, mercury. Of course, old vacuum systems would use mercury diffusion pumps and also uh, different kind of mercury manometers. And so there was a genuine chance that you might have a mercury vapor contamination. But yeah, let's get into it. So, this is pretty much exactly as the textbook says a mass spectrometer should look. By the way, when you work with this kind of thing, you really, really want to keep out your finger grease. That's why I'm wearing gloves. You should probably wear uh, like uh, um, lint-free lint cotton clean room gloves. I don't have that, so uh, let's hope everything is okay. So, let's look at this. What do we actually have here? So. First of all, as you saw before, we have a flange. This flange is a conflat. This is a 2.75 inch conflat, also known as a CF40 or CF35, 
flange. And you can see how we have seven pins back here. The big pins are just locating for the electronic module that's supposed to go on the back here. Seven pins, and I can already tell you that the sensor pin is probably going to be the detector, because you can see the insulator is a little bigger. And that's usually an electrometer that goes there, so you would want the higher creep resistance and higher impedance. So this is the iron source. It's pretty simple. Let's start from the bottom. Here is the metal cylinder that houses the quadrupole. It's grounded. It's at zero volts. Same voltage as the case of the vacuum system. On top of that, here is a thin plate that has a hole in it. That small hole is what extracts the ions into the quadrupole. So in mass spectrometry, first we want to make ions, then we want to sort them by mass, and then we want to detect them. So here, this up here is where we make ions. So there's a grounded plate here that's connected to this grounded tube that houses the quadrupole. There's a small hole in the center of that tube, and that's what extracts the ions out. On top of it is this insulated structure here with a plate, a cylinder, and a plate. This is at a, and you can see the wire for it coming up here, this is at a positive voltage, something like 100 volts. So when the filament up here, which is at about 0 volts, this is just a thin light bulb like filament that will get red hot and emit electrons. Those electrons will be attracted down through this little cylinder here and hit something and collide with that. Now this stream of electrons will collide with neutral gas atoms like nitrogen and oxygen and water and whatever and knock electrons off them and unionize them. And the electrons will then bounce off into the shield and the ions which will now be repulsed by the positive charge on these plates here in this entire cylinder here. There's a small metal grid on top of this cylinder here so they will not want to go back this way. They will want to go out through the tiny hole down here. It will be attracted to the zero volts because when you're positive then you're attracted to something that's zero volts. You will also be attracted to something negative but you're also attracted to zero volts. So they'll shoot down into the quadrupole and that's what we want. Top plate here is also a ground potential. Um, and you can see the wires coming on, on either side for the filament. The filament can also be tuned with a small voltage, uh, typically like plus minus 30 volts. Well, let's take this off, shall we? So, here we have the iron source, now you can view down the axis of it. You can see a small hole. I don't know if you can see there's a screen here, yeah, you can see there's a screen on top of that. And this is the hole where the ions are attracted down the quadrupole. Removing that, what you see on the screen is fairly boring. So, but if we look down this, we can see the actual quadrupole. These are very, very precise ground rods, and I would say it's probably impossible to build a quadrupole yourself with any sort of reasonable resolution, because the machining, grinding, and polishing operations are very, 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 very straining. And uh, you can see there's a ceramic spacer of some kind of uh, machinable ceramic in there that holds them in place. Um, but there is actually a YouTuber um, who has done that. I will link to his video in the description of this. But that's the quadrupole, and that's what actually separates the masses. These four rods are connected two and two in pairs across, so this one and this one is connected, and that one and that one is connected. And these are faced with an, a big RF transformer. They are phased to be 180 degrees apart, so they will be opposite voltage at opposite times. This generates like a spiral pattern for the ions to follow, and for a given amplitude and frequency, only one mass to charge ratio of ion will be stable through this. Very light ions will simply just scoot off and be too attracted, and will simply just scoot off, and heavy ions will just not really be course corrected enough to stay on track. The quadrupole is attached down here. We can remove this. 
Now I'm not going to remove the quadrupole poles from this tube out of fear of not being able to get them back in the correct place. I think they are indexed somehow, but it's one of those don't take the risk kind of deals. So uh, that's as much quadrupole as you're gonna see. So with the quadrupole we can now both generate cations, we can with the quadrupole impose conditions of what mass to charge ratio ions will go through the system. And now we need a way to detect those ions. And that's basically, as with optical systems, that is basically two ways of doing it. Either by counting the ions individually with a particle detector, like a scintillation counter or channel electron multiplier, or we can count the current. We can also do that with a channel electron multiplier, or we can do it with something much simpler, which is exactly what we're doing here. So what do we see here? Well, first of all, we see these weird spade connectors that connect to the quadrupole. And as you can see, this plate is just grounded to the envelope of the vacuum system. This is always a good sign, because this means that it's at zero volts, always. When you have to deal with ion optics, especially unknown ion optics, that's kind of a gift that you know that. And as you can see, there's also a screen over that there. Now we unscrew the last bit, so we can get to see the detector. By the way, if you haven't worked with conflat flanges before, this is a conflat flange. You can see it has a very sharp angled edge here. This edge is supposed to bite into a thin copper gasket and compress it enough that it is an actual complete seal. Like it's the most hermetic seal you can probably get. But this also means that this edge is very fragile. So I urge you, if you buy these flanges on eBay or something like that used because you're building your own vacuum system, then check check these flanges as good as you can on the picture. And if you want to be safe, then buy systems where these flanges are assembled into a larger structure. That's what I do. I buy like uh, assemblies of three or four vacuum parts. First of all, if one is broken, then you never get completely disappointed. And second of all, if it's completely connected as it is intended, then the flanges are completely protected, so you won't get any nasty surprises there. If something hard has been dropped on this edge and it has like a ding, then it will not seal, and it will never seal, and there's nothing you can do. Just a small hint. Right, we're moving the last two screws. Now, the detector. Now we can lift this plate out. Now we can lift this plate out. Yep. Yeah. And we can see the detector. This is just a hollow tube, there's nothing to it, with this screen on top. And as we can see, here's the detector. Huh? It's just a plate. This is what's called a Faraday cup. Or a collector. So ions will hit this plate and generate a tiny, tiny current. What you then need on the output side, and you can see, all of these pins are now just connected directly outwards to the feed through, as we saw from the inside. So that's basically the system. As you can see, there are only six connections. Quadrupole rod one, quadrupole rod two sets. The two long wires here, which you can see here, is for the filament. The little tiny tungsten wire on the top. This one is for the accelerating voltage off of the ion source. And then there's the collector plate, or Faraday cup. That's it. That's a mass spectrometer. Either way, stay tuned for more vacuum and physics and mass spectrometry and stuff. I hope you found that interesting.